All right. Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to review the or recap all the releases from all the applications. So under the meetings and trainings page at the bottom. Click on 2024 and June. And we'll start with USAS. Please let us know if you have any questions. In USAS, we had two regular releases, one of which included encumbrance adjustments. And these are to help us clean up some migration issues, but um, particular situations. So we only want the, this to be used after you submit a ticket and we review it just so that we can make sure it's not a bug and affecting everybody. And then we'll lay out the steps, which we have for some of you, steps and um, the procedure for doing so after we thoroughly test it and give you the instructions. Another improvement was the mass change definition. And this can be used with caution, of course, and it's used to update the invoice item received dates. So in the documentation, if you go to help and documentation, in the appendix under useful procedures, we added the um, the mass change definitions to change invoice item receipt date. So you could click here to download it and to use it in USAS. So let me show you an example. So this receive date is important this time of year because you wanna get the payable in the right fiscal year. So looking at this invoice, you have the date of the invoice, which is the date that I entered the invoice, but the vendor invoice, the physical date on the invoice is actually um, June 30th. So the user has that option of entering it in that field. And depending on the district rules, it will either default to the received date will either default to the current date, which is the date here, or by a rule for the vendor invoice date. So this mass change definition comes handy when you realize like today that you entered all your invoices for, um, and let it default to 7-5. So let me pull that up. But you realize even in the description of the invoice that it's for 24 services, fiscal year 24 services. So you want that in, you want that received date to be in fiscal year 24. So you have all these invoices that were, um, had the, oh, this is the date. To see the received date, I used an advanced query that I set up. And I would have to change this every year because of the date, but received less than um, 7-1. Yeah. So these are the invoices that I want to change. And I've already have the module for the mass change enabled. And you would take that definition from that useful procedures that I showed you and import the definition. Once it is, I can pull it up. You can load the definition here. You do want to filter the grid because all these records that are going to be pulled up are going to be changed. So if I have it filtered to 7-5, these are the invoices that I want to change to, we'll just say 628. So I have seven invoices up here that are gonna change all to 628. That's the only disadvantage is they're all gonna be changed to the same date. So if you want them different dates for whatever reason, you'd have to do it individually. So I submit the mass change by clicking the button. 
And now if I go into each invoice, you could see that it's been updated. So that's kind of helpful in certain circumstances. Any questions on that? Another improvement was to the report bundle scheduler. Let me go back to the instance. To make, when you're scheduling um, a report bundle, it'll indicate the required field. And a lot of people forget to put the archive type in. Well, now it has to be something. It's going to default to the first one, but that's nice. The next, the next release is going to make this mandatory to populate as well. But we do have a new tool tip. If I can get it to work. Well, another thing that they corrected with that improvement was to prevent the use of semicolons in the output field. So you can't enter one email um, with a semicolon in another one. And the tool tip, well, you can see it on the, um, oh, There we go. It's on the output field on the inner, the email address. Sorry about that. And then another, well, it wasn't an improvement. It was a new feature that allows vendors to be merged. And the vendors can be merged when they have the same 1099 type, the same tax ID type, and the same, um, no tax identification number. So I set up a vendor that I remember being several setups in the district that I worked for, and it was Scholastic. So you can see that we have Scholastic magazines, Sch Scholastic adventure magazines, science magazines, and kid magazines. So you can see here the requirement is I should have had this set up, but it has to have the same type ID and tax ID type. So when I go to do this, the second one doesn't match. So that's not going to be pulled in. So we'll remember Scholastic Adventure Magazine. So to do this, say we want to put everything in the first one. So you would click on Scholastic. Click on merge. You would click on merge vendor to see what other vendors are available to be merged. And you can see that it, that Scholastic Adventure magazine is not included because it's not eligible to be merged with this vendor. And the reason was because it didn't have the matching tax ID and number matching. So you can choose which ones you want to merge, one or all. And as soon as you click the merge, it'll you know ask you, are you sure you really want to do this? The vendors that you clicked here are, are will no longer be active. And all the transactions are going to now be tied to the um, Scholastic magazine. So these are going to be now under here. And if these have different um, location addresses, they're going to default to the vendor that you're merging it to. So once I click merge, it asks you and I say yes. You can see the vendors that got merged are now not active. And their transactions, year-to-date taxable and year-to-date total, are now under all the Scholastic magazines, and these are zeroed out. And on the vendor, 
There is a section here that says this vendor, which was Science Magazine, was merged. It's automatically checkmarked when merged. It informs you of where it was merged to and the merge year. And we also had a um, newsletter article about this procedure too that you can reference. Any questions on that? All right, other than that, we had like an internal uh, correction with the spring upgrade and a patch for the district that had something to do with the account change. I'm gonna jump to inventory really quick because we really only had one update, which was another internal update. But I also wanted to mention this location worksheet, sorry, location worksheet sorting. This was a JIRA issue that was somehow corrected on by working on another issue. And it was discovered when they went to work on the sorting that it was already fixed. So they added this worksheet sorting release to the one to this release, which I believe was the first one in January. But what that did was um, it updated the default sort to be location code. It's a location worksheet. So the default's gonna be location code, then item category, and then the tag number. And prior to this correction, it wasn't sorting like that. So now if the user also chooses other parameters, they'll be applied in the order selected after the location is used first. And then I don't think the sorts were being the, the user sorts and parameters were showing on the options page. And so that was updated as well. So this update is on the first release, but since it was discovered later than that release, we never talked about it. So I wanted to mention that. And now any questions on USAS or inventory? Okay, I uh, will hand it over to Andrea. You guys have a good weekend, thanks. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Okay, um, on to the next is the payroll releases. Um, we had two regular releases, which were one was on June 5th and one was on June 18th. And then the other one was a hot fix on June 14th. So not too many. Um, the first things we'll be going over is the bug fixes. Um, the payroll payment checking printing, a district of found when they were creating um, the payment for a check using XML file, um, it was duplicating the employee employee's check. Um, so this would be if an employee probably had two um, checkings or two savings, um, it was creating um, extra payments for this employee on the check, creating two checks. So we fixed that bug. And then the next one was when a uh, district was creating a W2C form for a employee. Um, they noticed that on the local tax um, was printing twice. So the gross and the amount withheld was showing twice on the local taxes on a single form. And that, that was a bug. So they did correct that. And then there was behind the scene on a soap bridge um, they did a converter with a payroll item, so they corrected that, so nothing to show on there. Um, the next one was improvements. Um, a mass load, um, a district found when they were um, creating um, a mass load file, and they had a uh, number entered with quotes and with a comma in it that it was erroring out having, um, so they 
now did an improvement where the system will ignore the quotations or in the comma too. So now they can have both on the um, file, but the um, mass load will and the software will ignore it. The next one is the Esteris Advanced Configuration. Um, this is a new one that they added. This would be for admins, which um, probably would be just you at the ITC, um, have the ability to actually update um, the advanced amount field now for districts. So maybe districts uh, ran their Esteris um, already and um, they paid an employee and they noticed that that amount um, was either not supposed to be an advance amount or maybe it was um, supposed to be advance amount and they did their corrections to the adjustments. Um, now you at the ITC can go in and actually either um, can remove that from the S3S configuration. So when they actually have their last pay in advance, then they will go to zero. Um, so this field can be updated, but just to make sure um, that those are what the, the corrections are um, cor from the district stating that they need that done. So now that is um, an option for you at the ITC to update that if they need to. Uh, perfect attendance report. Um, there was um, districts were wanting this report to run if they have selections under um, maybe they're including all three, which you find under attendance records. And maybe they included all of the um, vacation and sick and they wanted everybody that didn't miss a day. So if they were running this to get that perfect attendance report prior to this update, it was um, not excluding um, employees. Maybe they had missed one day in personal, but all the rest, they were zero. They didn't miss any. Well, the report was still including those employees. Um, they want this, the one the, so if they included all three or um, it was including just the um now won't include the in-person um, employee at all. If they miss one sick day, then it won't include them at all on the report. So, so they update it. So now it's looking at an or instead of and. So calculation. The next one is the 941 on the quarter report. Um, line 5D um, is the Medicare over the 200,000. So I included, I did a spread or a, like a worksheet that I included here for you that shows the different calculations. If the employee is a regular Medicare employee, if an employee is a full pickup employee. So kind of go over that a little bit. Um, and that line is on the 941 when you run the quarter report, it will show at the bottom down here. I know this is something districts were really were wanting. So the um, the first one I kind of go over would be if you had a regular Medicare employee. So to figure out what that Medicare amount over the two hundred thousand would be, would be first you would need to get so. Um, if the district is questioning that, you might have to get a backup before this payroll was completed or posted. So that way you have the before screenshot of the year-to-date amount of the applicable gross because you'll need that in the calculations. So I kind of have a after, before, and then, then I have the pay report also. So you kind of can see where these figures are coming from. So... What again that uses the gross of the applicable gross first of that payroll minus any um, section 125s or HSA withholdings. So this employee had one, which was the 3269. So that gives us our um, applicable gross of 202,843,12. So then what you do, you're going to calculate the total gross as what is showed on. Um, I guess I have the wrong one highlighted. I was using applicable gross, but the year to date. Um, 
sorry, I have those backwards. Sorry, the year-to-day applicable gross and then the total gross. So we would take the 202 and then the apple year-to-day applicable gross, which is the 33. I have to re um, switch those. Um, and then you get the apple go uh, plus the apple gross for the current payroll. So that would be your 236.08.13. And that's exactly what it shows here after payroll. So that's how that calculation come, how they get that calculation. So then we need to figure the amount over the threshold. So you take the total gross, which we just figured out, minus the 200,000 equals the $36,000, um, $8.13. And then you wanna calculate the amount under the 200,000 threshold. So you take the 200 minus the year-to-day applicable gross, which you get from the before payroll. So then we will take um, the 166 from line three and times that 0 0.0145. That gets us our 2419 plus we need to times the 36,000, which you get from line two, the calculate amount over the threshold times the 0.235. And if you add these two figures together, the 846 and 2419, you get your 326530, which is exactly what shows on the pay report. So there's a calculation for the regular employee using all these different figures. So hopefully this will be helpful when they're running their quarter report. So again, they probably will have to do um, a backup or UFIC will have to do a backup to get those figures, the, the before figure. Um, the next one is going to be, let's see, I think. Oh, I see. Goes over here. Okay. That's kind of confusing. I'm going to move this down. There we go. Okay. So the next one is if an employee at uh, the district, um, how to figure the employer pickup if they're full pickup employees. So again, we have the step-by-step uh, -step instructions here without the calculations, like the figures that I'm going to go over here to the right. Um, and we also have, if that if you have an employee at the district that's partial pickup, then we also have that included here. So we have the steps here from one, two, and three, but then it also tells you what to grab from the pick um, to take from up here on these lines. I don't have a calculation of a pickup for partial because I don't know how many people have partial pickup for Medicare, usually not very many. Um, so... Here is my calculation for this one. So what we do again, we take the applicable gross on from your payroll item, your today applicable gross before the payroll is ran. Oh, let's see, where am I? Here it is, right here. So again, you would need a backup of that screenshot of that applicable gross. Then you take the adjusted gross for the current pay. So again, you're taking it for the current pay minus any HSA or section 125s. So that's my 8980. And you're gonna take the total gross down here of the 203. So then we need to calculate the employer pickup percentage. So again, you do your 2.9 divided by 100 minus 0 0.0145, and that gets your um, 0 0.0145. And then you're going to take the calculated inflated current pay uh, applicable gross, which is your 203,871 from um, number two, divided by um, the... 0.985. I tried to put these in here earlier. So I'll put that in there. 
gets us or 206-871-37. So now we're going to calculate the total year-to-date applicable gross. So again, you take your line one plus line 14 we just calculated, gets us our year-to-date applicable gross to 260 944 20 So to get the inflated, the amount over the additional withholding over the for the threshold of two hundred thousand, we're going to take line five amount to sixty nine forty four twenty minus the two hundred thousand, gives us our sixty thousand nine forty four twenty. Okay, and then we're going to take that amount times the point zero one minus. 1 minus 0 0.0145, again, which is our, put that in there. So that would be a little easier to understand. And then that comes up with our $60,000, $60.51. So then you take that amount and then you divide the 0.985. Minus the point for one, or, or minus zero nine. So that should be point nine seven six. Okay, didn't put that in there. So then the sixty one five zero five ninety, it comes up with your. This is how that figure is calculated down here on your nine forty one. Um, line 5D then. So a little bit of, a um, lot of calculations in there. Um, so if you move to your step seven, then you take your 200,000 minus the 54, which is still your line one. You'll get your 145, 927, 17. So then you're going to calculate your total inflated. So you're going to take your 61505, which is down here on your line 5D and also on 6C. And you're going to add line 7 to get your 207-433-07. That's your total inflated. Now, the only other thing when I was going through these calculations, this line 2, I was having a little hard time coming up with this 3561. Um, which is the, oh gosh, I'm sorry, my chat, um, was this employer pickup amount. So I have this in to the developers just for a question on that because I could not get that line to come up um, according to what this was. So I will, I will make sure I get this um, corrected and updated and put back into the release notes. Um, but again, to calculate the pickup amount, it should be the line seven, times 0 0.0145. And then also you take the 61505, which is this line down here, times the 0 0.024. And that should calculate up into your employer pickup. But I was off by about $30. So I'm gonna, um, I have a, a question into them right now, but um, they're on vacation today. So I will make sure I get that updated for you. But that's, that is definitely the calculation for that. I just got to figure out what, um, if there's something missing here. Um, another thing, um, and then to calculate the normal employer withholding, which is just the employer down here, is the, um, 207-433, which is your line eight, times the 0 0.0145. And then to add those together, you would get the 65-69-11, which on the employee's pay report, you can see here. Oh, yeah, on the pay report, excuse me. So I know that's a, it's a lot, but hopefully this will help if districts have questions on how their calculations are coming up and how this line is going to be used. Um, so hopefully 
that's a little helpful. I have it included in there so you can go through there and kind of step through it and just see how each one is calculating to what like the earnings register pay report and the quarter report using the payroll items. So hopefully that's a little helpful. And again, I will update that um, probably next Monday to make um, to make sure I have this line um, calculated correctly because I was unable to get that to what um, they had in that calculation. So I'm, I'm just missing a step. Okay, any questions on that calculation? I know that was a lot to go over at this time, okay. Okay, so the next thing is the employee mass load. Um, this allow the CSV load. Um, districts wanted, um, if they didn't have um, the ID, if they could use the ID or the employee ID. So they updated that um, on this release. So now um, the ID, they don't need to have it only required um, required only when updating employees I, employee ID. So if they're not updating the employee ID, which um, a lot of times this is already done, but maybe they need to correct it or something, that's the only time they're going to need to have that database ID in that mass employee mass loader file. Otherwise, now they can leave it blank. Um, definitely when they're creating a new employee. And then the number, um, they can um, enter the only um, required when creating a new employee, otherwise they can omit it from the file. So again, um, they can go ahead and use the employee ID. Okay. The next thing is we had just some internal um, things done. Um, again, they had to update the Ohio tax tables for the July 1st and after for the payrolls coming up. And also there was, this was a hot fix. Um, the sur surcharge amount changed for fiscal year 24 to 30,000. So now that is updated. And then again, they had a couple of internal improvements, internal and um, improvements for ES ESAs. So um, again, I won't go through those because those were just behind the scene kind of things um, for the um, employer self-service. Okay. Um, if there is no questions on anything, I will send it over to Michelle, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Okay, all yours, Michelle. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. I hope everyone had a restful day yesterday. Um, what we're going to do today is just talk a little bit about um, employee self-service, um, where we're at right now in regards to the production release. Uh, but first, um, uh, just to recap what took place here in June um, with our early release, we had uh, several versions of the early release out there. Let's just update something real quick here. Okay. Um, and I think we had about, oh gosh, over 60 some issues that were done last um, in June regarding the early release. And, and as I did last month too, I'm not gonna cover all of these early release issues that would take all morning, um, but I just wanted to give you the links to those. Um, so obviously um, next month, when we go over the recaps for July, um, we will be covering the first official production release of ESS. And I'm going to take you to the release notes um, because um, Mark has done some updates in here. Um, and the early release notes he has placed in a separate area. And the first official release here, as you can see, um, will be uh, released today. And it's going to be version 2024.00. Um, so we plan on releasing that um, to all you guys um, later today um, with details about the production release um, that will be included in the notice that goes out uh, via SSDT notices. Um, and you'll notice as well too, if I click on this, Um, it'll um, 
detail uh, all of the uh, issues that are going to be on the first production release, and we had 32 of them. Um, but just one thing um, that I wanted to make uh, you guys aware of, as we discussed uh, before, is that it is important that your USPS versions and workflow versions are up to date um, before um, the first production release of ESS goes out. So um, they do have a note here regarding that. So yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. So we're excited to, uh, to finally announce that uh, we can release this production uh, in live. Um, so that will help you guys too, to get going on um, your actual uh, conversions from kiosk to ESS. Um, one thing I wanted to discuss in particular about this is the actual um, ASAP integration and the timesheet, because I know you guys have had questions about those as well. So the ASAP integration will be available on the production release. Um, so um, most of the, um, you know, the most important issues regarding the ASAP integration are complete and um, they are noted um, down here in the actual uh, issues um, that will be included on that first production release. Um, but yes, that will be something that um, we thought, you know, as we were, um, you know, kind of reviewing this yesterday during our, our or a couple of days ago during our sprint meeting, um, is possibly doing an additional um, session on just the ASAP integration with the ITC staff. Um, so I plan on discussing this later. I have a meeting with Matt and Mark and um, trying to find a date within the next week um, that we can get this scheduled. Um, so I know it's a really busy time with fiscal year end and vacation. So obviously if you aren't able to attend this ASAP integration training, um, then it will be recorded so that you guys can review it. Um, so um, so we're, we're working on that and hoping to get something out once, you know, I, I find out everybody else's schedule and get that going. Um, also, like in regards to the ASAP integration, you know, we are busy getting the documentation updated. Um, I just wanted to show you where in the documentation um, that there is like the actual ASAP integration menu option. And it is listed down here with all the other available options in ESS. And if I take you to that particular section, make it to ASAP integration here. Um, so this is the actual chapter uh, that um, we've been trying to complete here. Um, and this is still a rough draft. So, you know, we are working on this and hoping to get it um, done uh, before, you know, we have this training with you guys. Um, but um, we have like an integration setup area that just talks about how your districts are currently using ASAP with kiosk and how they need to proceed with ESS. So we kind of had the different options here on the actual integration setup information. You know, if they're, you know, aren't going to be, if they're just going to be using ESS and not using ASAP, well, obviously there is, there, you don't have to have an ASAP integration required. Um, if they are using ASAP solely and not using ESS to submit their, the entire district, to submit their um, leave request, do their sub calling, do the workflow that is all going through ASAP currently, then they could continue doing that. But we do have some information in regards to what they can do with employee self-service. Um, so that's discussed here. And then if you have districts that may be using ASAP and kiosk, so maybe they're uh, their employees that need to have a sub are using ASAP, but those that aren't um, are using kiosk right now. Um, this details what can be done in ASAP and ESS. Um, so, you know, we talk about that at the beginning of this, and then um, we go into then the actual options available in the ASAP integration. Um, and they're just... Um, viewing type of information. There's nothing that is going to be added or imported or processed in this option. So there's a data import view that basically contains the leave request data from ASAP that gets pulled into ESS. So we'll discuss all of that, obviously. Like I said, this is a rough draft, so we still have information that needs to be done in here. Also, we have an ASAP data sync option in here, and we still need to include the documentation about that as well. 
But uh, this is just one area. Um, we also have underneath system and underneath the configuration, um, go to the actual configuration options. We have an ASAP district configuration option in here as well. So if you are converting um, their uh, ASAP configuration settings and kiosk um, into the ESS import, um, those settings then will transfer over into the ASAP district configuration. Said there's not a documentation for this yet. That's where that's going to show that information and we'll explain that. So it is just like the kiosk ASAP configuration menu has the same options. So um, really not a whole lot of difference there. Um, so yeah, and I know we have other areas too in the ESS documentation. Um, in regards to ASAP. So that stuff will be updated as well. So kind of like on my to-do list today to get that done. Um, but I, yeah, I just wanted to tell you guys where we, where we are at in regards to ASAP with the production release. ASAP will be a go, um, you know, and, um, you know, you can start you know, converting those uh, districts that are using ASAP with the information that's going to be provided in our um, setup here. Um, also, in regards to the production release, I know a lot of you had questions about timesheets. Um, so we are wrapping up some final issues that will be included on the initial release. Um, so there are still some things to do. Uh, so we um, uh, so we will have some other final issues to do post production release in timesheets. Now we have confirmed that there is probably, I think approximately six districts that are using timesheets right now. Um, so obviously we don't feel like this is going to be a significant impact on the conversions. Um, if you have districts that aren't using timesheets, uh, um, you can convert them over. And then those that are, are you know, until these uh, final issues um, get in, put into place uh, post our initial production release, at that time then you can um, convert those over. So. Timesheet documentation is not ready yet. Um, so you know, we will have to get that updated as well. And we are planning on doing a timesheet um, training session. Right now we have it tentatively scheduled for the end of July, that last Friday of July. Um, so we will be covering timesheets at that time. But I just kind of want to let you guys know where we're at regarding our initial production release on ASAP and timesheets. ASAP were there, timesheets were almost there. So we will have more updates after the first initial release that needs to be handled. Um, so I wanted to let you know what's going on there. Um, any questions regarding that before I move on? Okay. Um, also, our ITC training, just to cover what's coming up, um, we do have a here, go into July. I can't believe we're in July already. We do have a deeper dive into the certification appropriation resolution reports and spending plans. So we, um, very good one in regards to uh, USAS with this year end time. Um, so we will discuss that on the 12th. And then on the 19th, and again, another fiscal year and related um, topic is reviewing the common EMIS errors and how to prepare for the end of year EMIS um, submissions when it comes to USPS. So that'll be on the 19th. And then on the 26th, like I said, we will be doing a preview of the timesheet option in employee self-service. Um, this may change, it just depends, but um, as far as I know right now, this is gonna be a go. And we'll be doing that one at the end of July. We just added that. Um, not too long ago, so um, so that's kind of where we're at with July right now. So every Friday, we've got something, a session going on here. So I know July is busy, and I appreciate you guys taking the time um, to attend our Fridays with Fiscal sessions, but if you don't have any other questions, I think we're good to go. I want you all to have a, a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.